global gathering. As the G7 summit comes to a close in France, President Donald Trump takes questions from the press. What he says about the trade war with China and the threat from Iran. Fire in the Amazon, a report from Brazil on the devastating blaze prompting concern around the world, including from Pope Francis. The Vatican and Vietnam, the Southeast Asian communist country reaches an agreement with the Holy See. We have a report from Rome. And honoring a saint, we remember one of the most beloved Catholic figures on the anniversary of her birth. On EWTN News Nightly for Monday, August 26, 2019. Good evening from Washington, D.C., and thank you for joining us for News from a Catholic Perspective. I'm Wyatt Coolsby. President Donald Trump is on his way back to the White House after the G7 summit in France. During the three-day gathering, world leaders discuss trade, the environment, and a possible diplomatic breakthrough between the U.S. and Iran. White House correspondent Mark Irons reports. Mark? Wyatt, at the end of this year's G7, the leaders agreed to a short declaration calling for fair trade and the stability of the global economy. Now, President Trump has his own views about how that can be achieved, but the next round of G7 discussions could take place at his own resort. President Trump says the word unity best described this year's G7 summit of world leaders. I think most important of all, we got along great. There was uncertainty going into the weekend regarding global markets and the impact of the trade war between the U.S. and China. President Trump did give stocks a boost when he announced a trade deal with Japan and said China is ready to resume trade negotiations. We've gotten two calls and very, very good calls, very productive calls. They mean business. They want to be able to make a deal. French President Emmanuel Macron says the U.S.-China trade war is bad for the global economy. He's encouraging both sides to compromise. Macron also seeks to settle the growing conflict with Iran. He surprised some people by inviting Iran's foreign minister to the sidelines of the G7. I'm looking to have a really good Iran, really strong. We're not looking for regime change. You've seen how that works over the last 20 years. That hasn't been too good. President Trump didn't meet with the foreign minister, but later said he is willing to meet with the president of Iran even in the next few weeks. But we can't let them have a nuclear weapon. Can't let it happen. So I think that there's a really good chance that we would meet. One session the president did not attend at this year's G7 was on climate change, but he did share his thoughts on combating the issue. The United States uh, has tremendous wealth. I'm not going to lose it on, on dreams, on windmills. Looking to next year, President Trump is considering hosting the G7 at one of his resorts in Miami. It's a wonderful place. In my opinion, I'm not going to make any money. I don't want to make money. I don't care about making money. He's also keeping the door open for Russian President Vladimir Putin to rejoin the international summit. Having them inside the room is better than having them outside the room. G7 countries also held urgent talks about those wildfires raging in the Amazon. The leaders agreed to $20 million to help fight the fires and protect the rainforest. Now, that gesture was not received well by the president of Brazil, who said the G7 treats the Amazon region like a colony. Wyatt. White House correspondent Mark Irons reporting. Thanks, Mark. Pope Francis praised the Amazon fires will be contained as quickly as possible. Siamo tutti preoccupati per i vasti incendi che si sono sviluppati in Amazonia. On Sunday, the Holy Father shared his concern for the fires that have been burning for the past two weeks. He warned the green lung of forests is vital for our planet. Backed by military aircraft, tens of thousands of Brazilian troops deployed this weekend to fight the fires in the rainforest. On Sunday, firefighters from the National Force headed to the region to aid in the effort. Aerial images captured by the international environmental group Greenpeace show the devastation as the fires continue to sweep across the Amazon. Join me now from Manaus, the capital of the Amazonas state, is Philip Crowther, international affiliate reporter for the Associated Press. Philip, welcome back into the newscast. Give us a sense of the scope of these fires. What is it like there on the ground? 
Well, the first thing that's important to note is this is not one gigantic fire, the likes of which you might have seen in California or across the United States. These are many, many thousands, tens of thousands of small fires in an incredibly vast area. We are here in the capital state of, of Amazonas, in Manaus, a city of two million people in the middle of the jungle. There are some fires relatively close to here. Others are thousands of kilometers away. Now that gives you an idea of how big this space is, how big the Amazon rainforest is, and how big a challenge it will be to get these fires under control. Of course, not all of them will be uh, get gotten under control, and maybe not all of them should, because Pretty much every year, some of these deforested areas do get burnt by the farmers to make space for further agriculture. This is simply something that the inhabitants here of Manaus, many of whom tell me that that is simply entirely normal. But, of course, we have to mention that the number of wildfires in Brazil, in the whole country of Brazil, is up by 85% compared to last year, and especially in this state, of Amazonas, records are being broken that have been around for decades. What role will the financial support from the G7 countries play in fighting these fires? That's a good question because it's only just been announced, of course, by the group of uh, G7 countries over in Biarritz in France. The first thing we really need to find out here is how much coordination there truly was between the G7 and Brazil, because European leaders and the Brazilian president, Jair Bolsonaro, simply have not been getting along, because many world leaders have in fact seen him as being the man at fault for these many wildfires, because uh, he has been so lenient toward uh, deforestation. So we're not really clear what exactly that money, those $20 million from the G7 countries, is actually going to do on the ground. Now what is of course happening here right now is that the army has been getting involved but on a pretty small scale. Jair Bolsonaro, the president, says that 44,000 troops are being deployed but they're not on the ground. This is not a large-scale military operation right now. At the weekend only 700 troops were in action only in one very small area. This is a vast problem for Brazil to get under control. When you think about that vast problem, we've heard the Amazon described as Earth's lungs. Remind our viewers why this region is so critically important to the health of the planet. Yeah, you're right to mention that, uh, and in fact, uh, it takes us back maybe uh, to one of the most important social media postings of this story. It came from the French President Emmanuel Macron. He spoke about the Amazon as our area, essentially, and that didn't sit all too well with the Brazilian president and with many Brazilians generally, because most of the Amazon rainforest is in fact in Brazil. But there is this sense that Brazil has to take care of this for the sake of the world. Now that's because around 10% of the world's oxygen is produced in the Amazon rainforest. Now the other reason why this is so important, first of all, is because of the oxygen production that happens in the Amazon rainforest, but secondly, it's what can go wrong with wildfires? Why do we care so much about wildfires happening in the Amazon? It's because with fires, carbon is released. Carbon goes into the atmosphere and can help create greenhouse gases. Greenhouse gases contribute toward climate change. This is a problem at a, at a very large scale. That is why world leaders are getting involved. That is why people around the world care so much about this story. And that is why they want the Brazilian government to intervene as much and as quickly as possible. So incredible to think about the size and scale of these fires. Philip Crowther, international affiliate reporter for the Associated Press, thanks very much. Thank you. Our partners at Catholic News Agency report Cardinal George Pell will appeal his conviction to the Australian High Court. It comes following the decision last week by the appeals court in Victoria to uphold his conviction for child sexual abuse. For more on this developing story on the former Vatican official, visit CatholicNewsAgency.com. Iran says the crude oil aboard a tanker pursued by the United States has been sold to an unnamed buyer. The Iranian vessel was seized last month off Gibraltar. It was suspected the ship was going to deliver its cargo to Syria, which would break European Union sanctions. The U.S. has a warrant in federal court to seize the ship, but it's still traveling across the Mediterranean Sea. It's carrying around $130 million worth of crude oil. 
A Catholic priest was stabbed to death in a northern Mexican city just across the border from Texas. Officials from the Diocese of Matamoros are calling on authorities to investigate. It is believed to be the first death of a priest in Mexico this year. In the previous seven years, more than two dozen priests have been killed. A group of Iraqi Christians celebrate mass in the ruins of a church nearly 2,000 years old. Members of the East Assyrian Church worshipped in the church just 15 miles south of Baghdad. Over the past 20 years, Christians could not visit the remnants of the church, first over safety concerns and later because of attacks by ISIS. The site was reopened last year. Vietnam is one step closer to having a Vatican ambassador. The communist country in Southeast Asia and the Holy See have reached an agreement to allow for a papal representative to be appointed by the Vatican to be a permanent resident. It's considered an important step in diplomatic relations, but the Holy See says they are not yet ready to appoint an ambassador known as an apostolic nuncio. Join us now is Solin Tadier, European correspondent for the National Catholic Register. Solin, how did all of this come about? Why it's last week, a delegation from Vietnam and the Holy See met for the eighth time. The meeting was presided by Monsignor Camilleri, the Under Secretary of the Vatican's Relations with States and Vietnam's Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs. According to a joint statement from the working group, they reached an agreement on the ways to uh, better promote the relations between the Holy See and Vietnam uh, in the future. Uh, in particular, they discussed the um, principles, uh, points on the, on the regulations, on the statutes, and uh, the, the, the office of the resident papal representative in Vietnam. Uh, they also met with Pope Francis and the Secretary of State, Cardinal Pietro Parolin. The Vatican and Vietnam haven't had any diplomatic relations until now. Uh, but they, they started uh, formal discussions, bilateral discussions, uh, since uh, 2008. The U.S. fought a long war in Vietnam to combat communism, ultimately lost. Can you tell us about the Catholic Church there in Vietnam, how it functions in a communist state that's atheist and restricts religion? Well, Catholics are estimated to make up about 7% of the whole Vietnamese population. Vietnam, Vietnam's law uh, on religious freedom has been under discussion uh, since uh, 2013 when the Vietnamese constitution was revised. So formally, the law guarantees religi religious freedom and freedom of belief to people. But over the past decades, Catholics have been uh, under uh, huge limitations under the, the communist regimes, regime that took power in uh, 1976. Uh, and. Uh, yeah, the government is uh, still persecuting religious minorities in the whole country. So, Lynn, will a Vatican representative in Vietnam be able to help protect the Catholics who are persecuted? Well, a Vatican ambassador represents a soft power able to uh, avoid war in a country. So, uh, the presence of a Vatican ambassador uh, means that the local authorities are held directly accountable for their action. So the, the presence of an ambassador there uh, will mean that uh, he, will, uh, he will have a better understanding and a better knowledge of the, of the situation of the Catholic faithful in the country. So uh, it, it can only have a positive impact uh, on the local population and it will uh, enable the church to better protect uh, his, uh, its uh, local faithful. And of course, we're watching to get to that point. Hopefully, we will get to the point where we'll have an actual ambassador right now just being talked about with just the representative on the lower level. But certainly, we hope all of that will come to fruition. So, Lynn Tadier, European correspondent for the National Catholic Register. Thanks so much. Thank you. Coming up, Planned Parenthood tries to stop a pro-life measure in Missouri. Planned Parenthood is asking a judge to pause a new pro-life law in Missouri. The measure bans abortion around eight weeks of pregnancy and bans abortion on the diagnosis of Down syndrome. It is set to take effect Wednesday. Only one clinic in the state performs abortions. 
Washington State withdraws from the Title X Family Planning Grant Program rather than following new rules that ban recipients of those grants from referring women for abortions. This news comes as the state's lawsuit against the Trump administration plays out. In a letter to the Department of Health and Human Services, state officials write, quote, these new rules require our providers to deprive their patients of the information and services they need to make and carry out fully informed decisions about their reproductive health. Join me now to take a closer look at the Trump administration's Protect Life rule and what these withdrawals from the program mean is Michael New, associate scholar at the Pro-Life Charlotte Lozier Institute. Michael, welcome back to the broadcast. Many pro-abortion advocates are saying that the decision by Planned Parenthood and others to leave the Title X program will hurt public health. What's your reaction? Uh, I don't think that's the case at all. Uh, it's interesting. Texas, back in 2011, pursued a policy very similar to what's happening at the federal level, and they excluded Planned Parenthood from the state family planning program. And since that time, uh, public health trends in Texas have been very positive. Uh, the minor birth rate since 2011 has fallen by 49 uh, percent. The minor abortion rates fallen by 57 percent. The overall abortion rate fallen by over 25 percent. There's really no evidence of substantial increase in unintended pregnancies. So the experience of Texas shows very clearly that you can have public health trends that are positive without requiring taxpayers to fork over billions of dollars to Planned Parenthood every year. Uh, what do you see as the political ramifications now that Planned Parenthood and others have decided to withdraw? I mean, how likely is this going to play with voters, do you think? I think politically it's going to be helpful for pro-life candidates. Uh, most people do not really want their taxpayer dollars either subsidizing abortion either directly or indirectly. Mm -hmm. So again, uh, this is something that pro-lifers have campaigned on. I think pro-life voters see this as a promise that pro-life politicians and President Trump are trying to uphold. So I think it's going to be a net positive for pro-life candidates in the 2020 elections. And we'll see. I mean, you know, that, of course, they're going to get pushback because of mm -hmm. all the money that uh, Planned Parenthood puts into this. Where are the newly freed up federal funds likely to go? And, and do you think faith-based programs will benefit? Uh, yes, I think that uh, first off, this doesn't cut funding uh, for Title X. Uh, it just allows other places to apply for these grants. A lot of the money might go to fairly qualified health centers, which tend to be more geographically spread out than Planned Parenthoods. They tend to be more likely to be in rural areas. They offer a wider range of services. And it was very interesting. New York Times actually this past week ran a good article, a sympathetic article, about a pregnancy help center in Tennessee, a rural part of the state. And again, it's not always clear that if these pregnancy help centers you know, will apply for these grants, uh, but it does show that they're freed up and they can go to a, a wider range of clinics in kind of a wider range of areas and offer a wider range of services. And I think it'll be a net, net positive for public health. I know pro-lifers have been looking for that to get more of those independent clinics on board. Do you think we'll see uh, other states follow Washington's lead in pushing back or, follow, or, or issuing a lawsuit against the Trump administration on this? I don't know if we'll see other states follow the lead of Washington state, but one thing that I'm always heartened by is that a lot of the exciting developments in the pro-life movement are happening at the state level. It's interesting there are 18 states in addition to Texas uh, that are basically limiting the ability of Planned Parenthood or other abortion facilities to get taxpayer dollars from some or all grant programs. So again, I think that that's reason for hope. I think that uh, the experience of Texas and at the federal level, uh, we can show that uh, hopefully the other states will go ahead and uh, protect their taxpayers from funding uh, elective abortions either directly or indirectly. Okay. Well, like I said, there's uh, so many important issues here to break down, so we appreciate your coming on to give us some of the numbers and to give your analysis. Michael New, Associate Scholar at the Charlotte Lozier Institute. Thanks, Michael. Oh, thanks for having me. Representative Sean Duffy is resigning from Congress. The Wisconsin Republican says he plans to spend more time with his family. The practicing Catholic says he recently learned his ninth child, due in October, has a heart condition. Duffy was elected to Congress in 2010. He has been a strong supporter of President Trump. Up next, we remember St. Teresa of Calcutta on what would have been her 109th birthday. A new poll says Americans have shifted dramatically on the values that matter the most to them. The Wall Street Journal NBC News study says 50% of Americans say religion is important. That's down 12 points from 1998. And 43% placed a high value on having children. That is 16 points lower. Joining us now to discuss the study is Dr. Charmaine Yost, Vice President of the Institute for Family, Community, and Opportunity at the Heritage Foundation. Charmaine, welcome back. What do you make of these numbers, and, and why has religion and starting a family specifically dropped so much? 
Well, hey, thanks for having me, and thanks for paying attention to this story because I do think it is really important and really concerning because, you know, these questions of family, community, and, you know, forming a family are, are at the center of what really gives meaning, and there's even research that shows that these are the roots of happiness for people. And so to see young people losing confidence and losing a focus on the things that ultimately give value to your life, I think that's something that we need to sit up and pay attention to. And it's happened so dramatically just within the last 20 years is how much has gone down. Um, how much of a concern is this? Well, listen, the other thing is that I would draw people's attention to is I put this together in my head with the, what we're calling the markers of despair that are also all rocketing upwards. People are hearing a lot about the opioid crisis, but at the same time you're seeing all the numbers on opioid um, abuse going up, you're also seeing numbers go up for suicide, despair, anxiety. All of these markers of despair are going up. And I don't think it's a coincidence. Obviously, ca proving causality is one thing. But I think we all kind of intuitively understand that as community is breaking down, as young people are feeling more disaffected and less of having a sense of rootedness in a particular place, um, maybe not even um, a physical place, but feeling a place in the world um, that family and community gives to you, it's not a surprise that we're seeing a lot of um, a lot of this kind of emotional distress. And obviously, when it comes to churches, the Catholic Church, other exactly. Christian churches, obviously, we're seeing a decline in people attending church. I'm guessing your position is that all these things are interconnected. This is related. They absolutely are, and you know, there's certainly in across and across faiths and across denominations, there's there is evidence that they're paying attention to the fact that they need to reach young people. Um, but it's, it can't be said enough that we have to be looking at how is it that we continue to communicate the transcendent and eternal truths to the next generation. Should candidates running for president address this poll? I mean, and how much do you think they would be willing to pay attention to this? Well, I absolutely think, you know, I'd like to see more data. Um, you know, you don't want to put too much stock in only one poll. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it's terribly surprising that you see questions of patriotism declining along with some of these others. It, it's it Patriotism is also a sense of connectedness, right? And part of my concern as you look at 2020 is that anytime you have a presidential election, it's a national conversation. Mm -hmm. And so um, as you see a lot of the toxicity that we're seeing in our politics, I think we want to be paying attention to that as well. And what is is it what do we call our politicians to civility and to an emphasis on um, paying attention to valuing our country and valuing the things that make America great? I know it's hard to predict the future, but what do you think about this t trend? Is it still growing? Do you think this is going to get worse in the next 20 years? Are we expecting lower numbers? What do you think? Well, I think that um, I think that we need to pay attention to it and find you know rebuilding. A fraying of social fabric is is a real challenge because it is so complex. Um, it starts with the family and it starts with the individual though and those are the things that are encouraging as we see other markers of people coming together. Well we've been concerned about these issues for a long time to say the breakdown of the family, decline in church attendance. It's so interesting to get, get your take on this and obviously see how all of them are so interconnected. Dr. Charmaine Yost, Vice President of the Institute for Family, Community and Opportunity at the Heritage Foundation. Thanks so much for coming Thank in. Thank you. Sisters from the Missionaries of Charity pray at the tomb of the order's founder, Mother Teresa. The beloved saint was born on this day in Macedonia in 1910, 109 years ago. Mother Teresa spent 45 years serving the poor, the sick, the orphaned, and the dying. She was declared a saint by Pope Francis in 2016. Finally tonight, a Catholic nun who became a viral sensation for throwing out the first pitch at a baseball game last year is at it again. Sister Mary Jo Sobiak threw out the first pitch Saturday night before the Chicago White Sox played the Texas Rangers. Sister Mary Jo teaches theology at Marion Catholic High School in Illinois. Last year, her opening pitch before a White Sox game was a finalist for Best Viral Moment of the Year on the ESPYs Award Show. It also landed her a ceremonial baseball card and bobblehead doll. And I'm sure she enjoyed throwing out that first pitch once again. Certainly looks like she enjoys it. And that concludes our newscast for tonight. We thank you for watching. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Wyatt Goolsby. We'll be back tomorrow with more news from a Catholic perspective. Good night and God bless.